What's up, guys? Welcome to Believe in Rams, a part of the Believe Network. Aaron Coscarelli back with you. You know the drill. Be sure to subscribe, comment, rate, follow this podcast. You can also catch us on Believe TV and follow us on all the socials. Bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoff stats. All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay. We've got an awesome guest. We always do, but this one in particular, dear friend, former colleague, Bucky Brooks. He is the host of Believe in Jags. He is the Jags radio analyst. He is a former NFL player, scout, NFL network media member. He is a man about town. Uh, He is everywhere. And of course, you know, I'm going to ask him all things Rams. How did they hit on the draft? Uh, You know, he does the draft every year with... Uh, Daniel Jeremiah on NFL Network. So he knows every single team inside and out. And I want to get to all the juicy details on whether the Rams can compete with the Niners uh, this season and if they've done enough. All right, let's get right to it. I mean, we always have an awesome show. Every guest is uh, is very cool, but this one in particular, uh, NFL colleague, former NFL colleague, you have your finger on the pulse, Bucky Brooks, when it comes to all things NFL. I I, I can't wait to talk to you about the Rams, but first and foremost, how are you doing? Thanks for jumping on. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm excited. It's been a long time since we chatted. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything is going well. I'm excited uh, to see you talking all things Rams mm-hmm. because the Rams are pretty popular right now. Uh, I am obviously in LA. I coach a bunch of little high school kids and they love to run out and talk about whose house Rams out. So uh, I get a chance to share this with them later on and, and mm. get their reactions on if they think coach Brooks knows what he knows about the Rams. Well, let's get right into it. What do you know about the Rams? I think, you know, they've had, uh, they've been a big storyline for a reason, right? They don't have Aaron Donald this year. They have Matthew Stafford, 36. There's some contract issues. You know, what's your take on the state of the Rams as we see them now post-draft? Uh, I think they had a schedule. Uh, anyone that looked at this team last year uh, would probably anticipate that it was going to be part of a rebuild. But for the team to play and perform like they did, to get into the postseason, to have the kind of season that they had with so many young players mixing with old established vets, while Sean McVay is also kind of having a cultural makeover within the building, to me, it was a very, very impressive coaching job. And I think the building blocks are in place for this team, I won't say necessarily to be a contender, but to be in the conversation for one of those teams that wouldn't be a, a surprise to see them emerge as one of the teams that ends up being at the top of the the NFC or near the top of the NFC when it's all said and done. I mean, I think Rams fans, their biggest concern, especially in that division, is taking on the Niners. Have they done enough? And I know we're in May. We had Andrew Siciliano on the other day, and he's like, we're in May. So I don't know about the record. But from, you know, you're a former scout and obviously player and all things NFL. You know, what do you think the Rams... Do they still need to do something to compete to, with the Niners? Um, look, I, I think the Niners will always kind of carry the target on their back, just given the success that they've had the last four or five years. Uh, the fact that they've been to a couple of Super Bowls, haven't won them, but they're kind of a team that you use as a measuring stick. The Rams have had success going toe to toe with the Niners. Um, that rivalry is real. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's funny to see uh, those teams square off, but we understand the magnitude of the rivalry. Uh, I believe that the Rams believe they can be on par with the Niners. I believe Sean McVay feels like that he kind of has a a knack or he knows how to deal with the Niners when it comes down to it. It's a matter of continuing to get the young players up and going, and then some of the veteran players getting them back and being available, Cooper Cup being available the entire time. Because what we really haven't seen is how good that offense can be Mm -hmm. when you have – Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua the entire time, you know, and and what kind of creativity can Sean McVay use 
to unlock both of those guys while still getting the running game going with uh, Karen Williams and then incorporating Blake Corm into the mix. Uh, offensively, they have exactly what you're looking for. The bigger question is, what is the defense going to look like post Raheem Morris and Jimmy Lake? I mean, that was going to be my follow-up. In, in terms of the biggest challenge you see on the horizon for the Rams, is it the defense? Uh, look, yeah, it, it, it will be the defense just because you have a new defensive coordinator. And I, I tend to, you know, when, you, when you're talking to kids and I'm talking about like players on my high school team, it's like playing a video game. You can have the same pieces, the same personnel, but if you and I are playing Madden, uh, we play the game differently based on what our preferences are. So how does Chris Shula utilize the chess pieces that are available in comparison to what Raheem Morris did and how he went about doing it? And let's factor in, 99 is not there, which is different because with Raheem Morris, he had the luxury of having a three-time defensive player of the year at his disposal. You don't have that. You have young players but how do you put that all together while maintaining the lofty standards that have been established for defensive performance in LA? Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest hole. The biggest question mark is how do you replace number 99? And when Steve Weish was on here, he's like, you just don't replace them. You, you try to find a way to compensate. Obviously they targeted a lot of guys on the defense this draft. I mean, it's hard to say we, we, we haven't seen them on a football field uh, yet altogether, but um, on a scale of one to 10, how confident do you feel if you were a Rams fan about what they did? Did they do what they needed to do to try to compensate for 99? Well, the first thing is you got to acknowledge that no one player or group of players will replace what Aaron Donald was and, and how impactful he was to that defense. But what you hope to do is get guys that are in that mold, not necessarily in terms of like their performance and production, but in terms of mindset and mentality. The mm -hmm. greatest thing that the Rams have is they had the luxury of having that kind of guy in the building and the young players, um, you know, particularly Kobe Turner and Byron Young, they had a chance to watch him work every day. And so then they can take the lessons that they learned from watching 99 and they can now share with Jared Verse and Brittany Fisk and try and get those guys to live and live up to and play up to those standards. And Sean McVay, like who seemingly is invigorated by the challenge of trying to get this young team going, he can continue to add to the culture in terms of like challenging the young guys to hit the ground running, to be what 99 was in terms of his immediate impact from the time he stepped onto the field to the time he hung up the cleats. Can you make that kind of impact on your teammates? And some of that will be through your performance, but a lot of it would be through the relationships and the connection. Uh, this team last year felt like it was so connected, player to player, player to coach, coach to coach. Can you duplicate that? Can you get that feeling again? Because if you get that feeling, all of the other stuff will fall into place. That's the biggest challenge, and that's part of what Sean McVay is attempting to do in the spring and summer, build that camaraderie, build that chemistry, mm -hmm. so the team is really connected when they get to training camp. Yeah, I mean, I love I love what you said right there, which is, you know, we've seen what Aaron Donald does on a football field, but none of us are in the locker room, you know, day in and day out. And the actual impact that has on other players in terms of motivation and, you know, inspiration and overcoming adversity. And it's interesting that you noted last season there was it was just a very tight knit group mm -hmm. and how important uh, that is, especially if you're a coach, that's so vital to be able to create that trust that you have with, with each other, young or veteran, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it never changes. And, you know, a lot of teams, everybody has their, like, their core values. And in some way, shape or form, it always comes down to around the same things, commitment, accountability, and trust. Like, do you have a team that's highly committed to the process and the work that you're asking them to do? Can you hold each other accountable? Can you check people when they need to be checked to make sure that they're playing and performing up to the standard? And if you can get the commitment and the accountability, well, then you can begin to build the trust that you need uh, to be a top team. Those things are there, but every year is a different year because you have different players joining the team and how quickly can you get the newbies up to speed and the newbies are not just the young players, but it's the free agent additions, guys who have been there, but have gone elsewhere. Then they come back. Can you get everybody on the same page and can you get everyone to be selfless 
in terms of sacrificing their own individual agendas for the sake of the team. It's easier said than done, but when it is done, uh, it allows your team to have a great amount of success on the field. Yeah. And trust. I love that commitment, accountability and trust, like with any good relationship, being able to, you know, call people out and know you have my best interest. You're not trying to take me down. Uh, do you think it's 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 an advantage that two guys coming from the same uh, university are in the draft, the, the, the rookie draft mm-hmm. class for the Rams? Is that an advantage? Well, I mean, like one, those two guys, uh, one, given their draft position, they're expected to be what we call pillars of the franchise, like uh, core players, guys that are going to be around for a while. The fact that they already have developed a level of trust, uh, that is good. That Mm. should allow them, particularly when they're lined up beside each other on that same defensive line, they know each other, they know how each other performs, they know how they work. Having talked to those guys and interviewed them together, you kind of know what they're about. So they're made of the right stuff. Then it becomes, because now all of a sudden the D-line room is really young. It's really young, but I would anticipate it being very competitive. Can that group get together and challenge each other and raise their individual and collective play because they are so competitive? Yeah, I think it's an advantage, um, particularly when you have guys who have the right character and it appears that their football character is exactly what you want and it fits into the culture of the locker room. Other than the obvious, what would you say the biggest challenge is for a rookie their first year? I mean, in my mind, I think it's the speed. But when we had Marshall Falk on, he said, you feel lonely, which then led to why he thought also uh, in agreeing with you that having two guys come from the same school with the same leadership and compelling ability, uh, that that's an advantage. But what would you say that rookies around the NFL are, are you know, their biggest challenge is as they head into the NFL and the pros? Uh, just the difference between the college game and the pro game from a professional standpoint. The preparation, uh, the attention to detail that's required to play great at the NFL level is different than in college. In college, you can be the most talented player and have a level of success. Well, now you're playing against everyone was a great collegiate player, mm-hmm. like everyone that you're facing. And so what how do you gain the advantage in the margins? That's through your preparation. That's through um, your attention to detail when it comes to your prep work and your conditioning. And then it's about, can you meet the veterans where they're at? So we talked about the culture being established and it could be as simple, as simple as hey, man, we run to the ball full speed on defense. Like we get to the ball, everyone meets at the ball. That is kind of what we do. Can you, do that? Can you fall in line with that? Or do you have a tough time kind of adapting to a new environment? It's really challenging for rookies because a lot of times we'll ding rookies and we'll get mad at them, but we don't know if they've ever been taught how to be a pro. So who is going Mm -hmm. to be the person that teaches them how to be a professional? Is there going to be a veteran in their respective position group that shows them, hey, here's how we go about doing business? Is it uh, Sean McVay kind of mentoring or, or, or pairing guys up with mentors so they can teach them how to do it the way the Rams want it done. A lot of that stuff is there. And, and uh, I'll be honest, the fatigue of being a rookie comes from you play your entire college senior final season. You then go immediately into training for the combine. You go from the combine to jumping into mini camps and OTAs. You get into training camp. And somewhere in the middle of the regular season, you hit a wall because you've been going – but 12 months straight without a break. And so do you have the stamina mentally and physically to endure the longest season of your respective career? Because after this season, it won't be like this, but this is the longest and maybe the hardest year of any football player, just because it's been year round and you haven't been given a break like you will be going forward. So that's the challenge. Can you keep it together when your body and everything is about to break down because it's been such a grind for such a long time. And that's such an interesting point. Mid season, there's fatigue there for rookies because they've been going nonstop mentally and physically. You know, another thing that was really interesting, I'd love to get your take on it. Uh, Tom Brady recently posted something on social media, sort of calling out the younger generation of football players, the rookies and, Mm -hmm. uh, and where their focus is with regards to this new thing that, you know, back when Tom Brady was a rookie, he didn't have to worry about social media. 
you know, where, are, where are you on that? Because it's such a, you know, there's endorsement deals. Players mm-hmm. want to be known for being them. You know, where do you fall in line with regards to a young football player's relationship to social media these days? I would say that as a, as an old timer, I think we have to understand that this is the hardest time to play professional sports than ever. And the reason why is because more people have access to you than before. When Tom Brady was a rookie and when I was playing in the league uh, in the 90s, you, you people couldn't get in contact with you. You couldn't hear from every fan. A fan had to interact with you face to face or it, maybe the media would criticize you. Well, now anybody and everybody can get to you just on Twitter. They can directly comment on on what you're doing, how you perform, they can do it in real time. So you go to the locker room, you pop open your phone and you have a list of notifications from people who are are in the ether basically saying, you suck, you're not good enough, you don't do this, why did Mm -hmm. you do that? All of these things. In reality, I would say that you have to be equipped with thicker skin now than you had to back then. And when we talk about mental health and how people handle that, look, I remember when I first jumped on Twitter, uh, I remember the first time people replied back and it wasn't something in favor of what you did and how you had to kind of stand back and be like, whoa. And then can you get past giving people uh, space in your head that really don't matter? I think that's that's really hard for young players who everyone is seeking validation and affirmation in those things. And when you don't get it, because like, you remember this generation has lived it out. They've lived out their entire world, their entire life on social media, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, you know, Twitter, like they've all engaged in that. And a lot of times because they've been the best players, it's always been positive. Well, this might be the first Mm -hmm. time that they're criticized and they hear and they receive negative feedback. And so you got negative feedback while you're trying to acclimate to the pro game, which is hard in itself. That's a lot being thrown at them when you're 21, 22, and just kind of on your own for the first time in your life. I mean, fascinating. Uh, I remember when I was with the 49ers back in 2013 and uh, Colin, Colin Kaepernick on Twitter would like people that said negative things on him. And, you know, I just remember thinking, I didn't know if it bothered him or not. I didn't know how he was feeling as a media member Um, but what I will say, uh, is these players are human. They have feelings no matter how much they try to turn things off. And the thing that's really interesting too, Bucky, as an athlete myself and under trying to really understand and respect the athlete mindset, think about it like this, right? And and you as a coach, these young people are actually getting validation because of their performance. So it's all sort of externally validated towards them, right? So, you know, to think about even the identity that they've that they've grown used to being identified as a football player, being identified as this talented, young, almost an anointed one at a five or six years old, and then they grow up. Yeah, I imagine that's really hard when millions of people mm-hmm. think they have authority to say you're good or you're bad or whatever. It's fascinating to me that people think that, you know, it's like so easy to do that. Yeah, no, it's, um, and so what they're navigating, not for the first time, but um, in, in a major way, they're navigating a bunch of transactional relationships, right? Whether mm-hmm. real or not, because those relationships that you have on Twitter, they're not, they're not real relationships, but it is a transaction based on, we love you based on what you do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And part of what you're trying to do, if you're Sean McVay and the Rams front office and all the people that work in player engagement, you're trying to equip the players with the tools to deal with the hard mm-hmm. stuff that is on the horizon. And you can't always do it like a in the weight room and on the field, but you have to prepare them for not only the the challenges that are ahead on the field, but the things that they have to face off the field. Mm -hmm. And the one thing about the national football league now is you have more resources available to help them. But a lot of times, you know, the, the unknown sports psychologist that works with the team, the unknown therapist that works with the players individually, they end up having a huge role in how the young players and even the older players kind of process everything that's being thrown at them while they're still trying to concentrate 
on being the best players that they can be for their team. So it's a lot that is going on, but the teams that are able to manage it individually and collectively are the ones that are the last ones standing at the end of the tournament. And I and I appreciate that. I mean, we talked about it uh, before off camera, how important the mental health side is. And, you know, you just can't replicate that, you know, Yes, of course, playing football physically is 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 such a challenge, but also the mental side of things. And, you know, as a as a young athlete, I was decent. I played soccer and uh, and club volleyball. I you say tran- transaction like I as a young athlete was transacted, whether mom and dad verbally mm-hmm. validated me because I was a pretty good athlete or then you, you know, let's say you're a young football stud and the transaction then becomes your peers. They're proving of you or women or me- whatever, whatever it is. It's it's a really dynamic thing. And and I think it's important to talk about what these guys, these young men have to go through when they enter the NFL so that we aren't so quick to judge or criticize. So, Yeah, one of the things that the Rams have always been at the forefront of is making sure that they did a really good job of kind of uh, creating an orientation program for their players to succeed. Going all the way back to when Jeff Fisher was the coach, they were like one of the teams that was the last to really give their rookies contracts because they wanted to equip them with financial literacy Mm -hmm. to deal with what they were about to have to face once they become like instant millionaires for some of them. Uh, They've always done a really good job of making sure they kind of put their young players in a cocoon to prepare them. And I would say I am encouraged when I look at Apuka Nakua, who's a fifth round pick who has a lot of success right away. And I look at some of the other young players that played well right away. It appears that they have the secret sauce to get their young players uh, prepared and ready to play Mm. with this class coming in and and how some of these guys, I mean, look, there there are a bunch of them that are going to be counted on to to be major contributors right away. How quickly can they get this class up and going? How quickly can they assimilate them into the program and help them find a way to be comfortable in a new environment, that's key. But some of that might have been, I say, uh, averted or the entryway may be easy for them because it's not a coincidence that it took older, more mature players, Mm -hmm. guys that were fourth and fifth year players, guys that played at big programs, winning programs. Sometimes you try to go for guys in, in that mold because it gives you an opportunity to get guys and fold them into the professional environment quicker then maybe some of your younger players who haven't accept, who haven't sampled some of the team success, they've had individual success, and they may be a little more selfish when it comes to um, the process and how you buy in or before they buy in to the team process. Mm, love that. Uh, before I let you go, I do want to get your your pulse on what's going on at the quarterback position. Stafford's thirty six years old. You know, uh, talk about his contract not being necessarily happy with the guaranteed money. If you're Stafford or if you're the front office, how are you seeing this play out? What's your take on a a sort of mildly disgruntled quarterback heading into a, you know, an important season for him? Well, the money is significant right now, the quarterback position. And when you're Matthew Stafford and you look around and you see $50 $50 million being thrown around mm-hmm. annually to guys like Jared Goff and on the horizon to a tongue of a lawyer is going to probably get that. Trevor Lawrence would probably command that. You're Matthew Stafford. And even though you're an older player that is in the twilight of your career, um, the compensation is not so much how much money you make, but the compensation is a reflection of how the team views you, how they mm-hmm. value you. And so if you're Matthew Stafford, you've taken this team to a Super Bowl and won it, you played, I mean, in a fashion that was very reminiscent of John Wade in terms of being the old cowboy that's battling through all the injuries, you want to just make sure that the team values you in in a way that you feel appreciated. And the only way to show that appreciation, and look, it's not the words of affirmation. Uh, Let me see what that check looks like. Let me see what the salary looks like. Where do you put me in the realm of quarterbacks to show me that you really view me as a quarterback, one that you want to be around for the foreseeable future? Mm-hmm. I mean, look, there's no shortage of, of 
juicy storylines coming out of LA. Bucky Brooks, so grateful to get your perspective on all things, whether it's on the football field or off the football field. I would love to have you uh, come back again and we'll see what ends up happening with Matthew Stafford. Hopefully he gets what he feels he deserves and uh, can't wait for a, a very exciting uh, 2024 season. So thanks again, Bucky, for joining. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me on. Let me come on anytime.